You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to True Wealth. I'm Dave Fasconi, and here with me is Maria Smith. Hello, Maria. How are you on this gorgeous day? Doing well. The day is really gorgeous. Yesterday was okay and the day before, but today is just one of those days that you just say, wow, how beautiful it is to be alive. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it kind of makes up for some of those really hot, humid days of the summer and those really cold, hard-to-work days in the winter. So uh, overall, uh, we get our fair share of everything, I think. Yeah, and we really, we really do need the days that aren't so good to be able to appreciate a day like this. Yeah, I think so. I think I think overall it makes us uh, better people. Can you imagine uh, having the perfect weather every day? Uh, we would just, in short order, I think, start to take it for granted and not appreciate it the way you and I both are appreciating this day. And we would just become a little more spoiled and uh, not realize just how blessed we we are um, uh, when the weather uh, turns out to be in our favor, you know? Yes. Mm-hmm. So um, we were talking a little bit before the show, and, um, you know, this, this, uh, we're in the middle of a, a lot of violence in our country. And um, when I started thinking about it, I, I kind of labeled it disorder. Um, I think society is in great disorder. And I'm not really talking about the disorder we see on the streets. That's a symptom of the disorder I'm referring to. When you ask how does the disorder we see on the news come about, I keep coming back to the disorder of the heart. And then you ask, well, how does the disorder of the heart come about? And the short answer is God, or should I say the lack of God. Every evil can be traced back to us us diminishing or eliminating God from our lives and therefore from society. So I think um, that this the, the last two weeks has been disorder uh, in, in a very intense way. But, again, what we're seeing playing out on the news is really a disorder of the heart. How do you, how does that sound to you? That sounds like a really good way to put it, a disorder of the heart, a disorder of what's most basic to the human person, the moral law that every human person has within themselves, within their heart, within their soul, is out of order. There's an unrest, there's a lack of peace. And when there's a lack of peace within the human heart, there's, it's going to show, like you said, the symptom, you know, it's going to show externally in disorder, confusion, and even, unfortunately, in violence. Yeah, yeah. And um, things, I think, have uh, reached, a, reached a point or reached a... Uh, I, uh, I don't know, I won't say a limit, but uh, it has made it very obvious, at least to me, that laws are limited in their ability to deal with disorder. Uh, I think laws more or less kind of address the symptoms because we tend to pass laws when someone or a group or whatever society is misbehaving, so we pass a law to stop the, the bad behavior. Uh, if we didn't have the bad behavior, there wouldn't be a law against it. There would not be a need for it. So uh, laws really are just Band-Aids. Uh, they're just treating the symptoms. And if someone, if a society doesn't start to seek the source, the root of the problem, then we just keep passing more laws. And like I said, 
laws are very limited in their ability to control uh, the average person because if whatever is in your heart, if it's good or evil or anything in between, you're probably going to follow your heart, not the law. And um, so, once again, this whole thing keeps going back to um, the lack of... Uh, we, we just put God in a very bad place in our lives for a lot of us, and that's showing uh, in our lives. And I, I just can't seem to find any other way around that because it all, when you start to do the research, you have to keep tracing it back to its source, and it always ends up in the lap of God for me. Yeah. You said um, that laws are limited. Well, laws are really for people who already want to do the good, and laws are meant to be for the common good. So if laws are not for the common good, if they're arbitrary or if they're for the selfish benefit of those who are enacting the laws, then, yeah, people are going to rebel on both sides. I mean, we've seen this even with the lockdown in certain states and certain areas where the people in charge are saying, you can't do this, you can't sell paint, you can't sell you know, seeds, you, you can't open. I mean, a big store can open and sell and get and get make more money. They already have a lot of money, big, the big department stores, the big stores. The little ones, no, you can't. You can't sell your things. You, you know, you're not allowed to. These laws were, are not fair, many of them. I mean, I'm not going to, I don't know, you know, each one individually. But these laws were not fair. And people are protesting them and people are disobeying them. And, you know, under God... We're not supposed to obey. Our allegiance is first to God, and we are not supposed to obey unjust laws. We're supposed to obey laws that follow in God's plan, because true law, true authority comes from God. And so when people take God out of the, out of the equation and they just want to do laws that benefit them, you know. I mean, some of the governors and some of the lawmakers, they let stores like liquor stores, tobacco stores, pot stores stay open because they get a lot of money from those stores. They get a lot of tax, you know, taxes from those stores. They don't get it from the other as much from the other places. So, yeah, close down those places. And I don't know all the intentions of people, but it does seem like, um, many of the laws that we have, and even the laws that, you know, help minorities or um, people who are having di- more difficult times, those laws, are they really to help them or are they to keep them in a certain spot where they become dependent on you so that they will do whatever you say? Yeah, that's, that's been, uh, I think, discussed and argued for, for decades but once again, it, it goes back to this, this concept of unjust or unfair laws are a disorder of the heart because the people that are passing these laws for selfish reasons um, aren't, uh, are, are operating from a disorder, a disorder of the heart because they're trying to uh, take advantage of a group of people. They're trying to enrich themselves at the expense of others. And it's certainly not following God's plan. So therefore, like I said, this whole thing can be really, I think, boiled down to a few very simple concepts. And disorder is, um, is, is and, and the heart are at opposite ends just like virtues and vices, uh, hope and despair. Uh, one is the problem, one is the solution. And a disorder uh, has to be dealt with uh, in the hearts of people. Uh, and here I'm talking about people have to have the right, uh, the, 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 the right desire in their heart. And that can only come from God. Um, they may think they can do it themselves, and yeah, maybe for a day or so. But what happens is the culture and the world starts to uh, 
uh, way upon you, and all of a sudden you're making decisions that might favor you over the good, the common good, or a group of people uh, that you particularly like, or a cause that you like over the common good, and there we go again. Um, so you can't use people as the measure for good. You have to go back to the ultimate good, the perfect good, which is God. Like I said, I, you can talk about this all day, but it really kind of all comes back to a simple point. And uh, for me, I, I've been doing this for literally decades. And that's why I'm a religious person, because uh, I can't find anything to, to be a better ex- explanation of what we're seeing in our world than, um, you know, a, a religion based on, um, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And the moral law, which is in the heart, like you're saying, which if it's not followed, if each individual does not follow it, becomes a disorder, which is, which comes into all of society. And so the people, the lawmakers, the people who are governing many of the areas in the United States, not all, there are some who are truly trying to enforce the correct laws, who are truly trying to serve the people that they were, you know, elected to serve, but unfortunately all too many aren't as well. And, um, yeah, and then you, at the end, you said the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yesterday being Trinity Sunday, there's something I read so, so beautiful about this, the Blessed Trinity. Uh, this is from a woman who I don't know very well yet, but I would love to get to know her better, Concepcion Cabrera de Armida. What she said was, the Father creates, the Son redeems, the Spirit sanctifies. We know that. But then she went on to say, the Father makes men. The Son makes them into Christians. The Holy Spirit makes them into saints. Oh, that was excellent. Say that again. Yeah. The Father creates, the Son redeems, the Holy Spirit sanctifies. The Father makes men. The Son makes them into Christians. The Holy Spirit makes the Christians into saints. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, go ahead, finish your thought. Because, uh, no, that's, I was going to say, yeah, yeah. I, I, when I, I heard that, I said, oh, it's so beautiful. That's just, yeah, it's exactly, and that's why we need the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one of the reasons. It's, you know, they all have... They're united, and they all have their special office, and the Holy Spirit takes the Christians, and there are many, 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 many Christians in the world, Protestant and Catholic, so many, and he makes them into saints, the Holy Spirit. And there's also many Jews or many people who do not believe in Jesus but believe in God because God makes men. So they have at least that. They're at the beginning of it. And then the, the God himself becomes man because he wants us to have such an intimate, personal, close relationship with him. Not just one of master, servant, or God, and we're way down here, and we can't get close to God. But God created us. He created the universe. And it's more of a of a servile love, a servile fear, a servile love that we have towards our creator. And then Jesus came to give us a filial love, a, such a close, intimate relationship and love that he desires of each one of us. And how can we do it? He sends his Holy Spirit. He sends the Holy Spirit to help us to sanctify us so that we can have this relationship with the Son who will bring us to the Father, and the Father and the Son will come and dwell within us. So it's such a beautiful mystery of the Holy Spirit. But it's not a mystery that we can't know anything about. It's a mystery that we can. You know, God is a mystery. And in the Old Testament, he's a mystery that keeps revealing himself. And then he reveals himself in flesh through the through the sun. And the sun reveals himself throughout the centuries. And now I think we're going to get to know 
the Holy Spirit more. I think we touched upon this on perhaps it was the previous show, how the Trinity we're getting to know is revealing himself more and more to all of us. Yeah, yeah, that was the Holy Spirit, the hidden God, I think you're referring to. Yes, that's right, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, and as you were speaking, I'm thinking, uh, you know, we're saying that unjust laws come from people with uh, bad intentions in their heart. Well, if you are on your way to sainthood, whether you know it or not, because you are, um, you know, uh, uh, in prayer, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit means something to you when you're trying to live the principles. You know, actually, even if you're not doing that, I'm sorry to interrupt, but even if you're not trying to, even if God doesn't really mean too much to you, but you're trying to live a moral life, be honest, be kind, be charitable. If you really try to do those things, even though you may say, because many people do, especially nowadays, many young people say they do not believe in God. You know, the largest group that's growing in America is the N-O-N-E-S, the nuns, you know, the nuns, people with yeah. no religion. So, I, it, you know, it, 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 it is helpful if you say you have some belief in some God, you know, the, the, um, the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, but if you're just trying to live a moral life, you're still, I believe, in, this, in the right direction. And everything that you were saying, I believe, applies to that, too. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the one thing that bothers me about the um, people that try to do it without God, I, I think there are some really good people out there that do just what you're saying. But the... the um, but the problem that I see often, or I can see it happening, is if you start to replace uh, your ideas of right and wrong because, in quotes, you're a good person, um, that all of a sudden you're moving further and further away from what the church teaches. Uh, and let's say, you know, the Christ started the Catholic Church, so the, the church teaching is what Christ uh, taught his disciples and apostles about how to live, how to love and how to live. And um, so I always go back to that as the uh, bar that we should all, uh, you know, uh, try, try to uh, – that, that's our goal. That's that's the, the highest bar that we can set for ourselves, or, or the highest goal we can set for ourselves. And when we start to substitute our own ideas of what's good, and the church has a name for it, it's called relativism. Uh, I think you can slip into relativism very easily. Uh, are yes. there people that um, can maintain a very pure life without believing in God? I, I'm sure. I'm sure they can, um, so let's give them the benefit of the doubt. But I, I do think that in today's world, with all the temptations, it's very easy to slip into relativism. Yeah, exactly. Really, it's very, very difficult if you say you don't believe in God to really be a moral person, I believe, because you're going to be swayed by certain things. Right. It's, right. You don't have the grace. You, you don't have the guideposts. You don't have right. the guidelines. Yeah, exactly. It is. And more, sooner or later, I think what you said does happen. Sooner or later, they're going to either they're going to make up their own rules or sway towards the wrong side. Or they might keep trying to find and seek the truth. And I think that if they do, and really they're going against a lot of odds there. They're really, you know, like a salmon going upstream trying to trying to serve the truth without God. Well, yeah, and this is where someone uh, that is seeking the truth you know, on a genuine basis um, would hopefully come to that realization that we already had a man here that told us the truth, the pure truth, and um, his name was Jesus Christ, and he's already done all the heavy lifting. I don't have to try to figure out every situation because his church has um, has the guideline, has the roadmap for me to follow, 
And all I need to do is spend my time and focus my attention and, and my strength on, on following church teaching. Now, for some people, that would be a bitter pill because they would have to admit that, you know, uh, something is better than them or bigger than them. But I think if it's the right institution and that you should do your own research to, you know, so you're comfortable with it. And that's what I've done. And that's how I got to this point. Um, because, like I said, um, the truth is out there. It's been out there for 2,000 years. It's just have people wanted to listen to it or not. And so the person seeking truth, I think, could gravitate, might end up going around in circles for a while, like a spiral, a tightening spiral. But he ends up believing in God because... God is the source of truth. I mean, does that sound like that could happen in one of these persons' lives? Yeah. Um, could you just repeat what you said at the very end? Well, I, I just think that anyone that's speaking the truth uh, ends up at God. Uh, because yes. if they're, uh, you know, they're going to start to read books on philosophy. I'm firmly convinced. Yeah. yeah, yeah I'm yeah, firmly that, convinced. Yeah, Maria, that's my point. You may have started out trying to be the a good person, the truth seeker, but if you are doing that, you will end up with God because that's the source of truth. I'm, I'm not sure how you could miss that uh, along yeah. the way. Yeah, I'm firmly convinced. I don't know if it would be 100% of the people would end up there. I think that if they're genuinely searching truth, I think they're going to end up there. And I think that if they're genuinely searching for true love, for kindness, for beneficence, for just um, for the greatest charity, the greatest love, if they're really seeking for that, they're going to have to end up with God. You have to because there is no, any, anything on earth is going to disappoint. You're not going yeah. to find the height. You're not going to find the absolute truth, the absolute love in anything on earth. So I yeah. think that you're going to end up there. And you know, what you were saying too before that, um, you know, they're, they're, I think you said, that, what, did you say that they were scared of finding something bigger than them or better than them? Yeah, yeah, I think people yeah. are. I think. Yeah, yeah. I think that that hits it right, you know, just hits it exactly where it, it hits it right on the, the nail, right on the head. Sometimes I have a hard time with that. But anyway, um, because... It's really pride. It's really saying, you know, I don't want something to tell me or to be better than me. I want to be my own person, my own God. I don't want mm-hmm. something other than me, outside of me. You know, when somebody's an adult, nobody's going to tell them what to do. Their parents can't anymore. And if they don't like their boss, you know, they can go get another job. Nobody's going to tell me what to do if I don't want to do it. And this is where God comes in. And I think that this is a difficult thing even for many, many, many people who say they are religious, even for many of us, I know for myself, even I think now God has given me the grace that I really can say to God, whatever your will. But I know for the longest time that caused me great, great fright, thinking, what does what if I don't like what God wants from me? What if I don't want to do it? What if it's too hard? What if he's going to ask me to suffer or do things that I really don't want to do? And I think that if people are honest and say they want to love God, but they don't want to say to him, whatever you want, no matter what, I will do it. And that really is, that really is the trust that God wants from each and every one of us to say, I trust that you love me and know what's best for me so much more than I ever could. I trust you so much that no matter what you inspire me to do, any good, obviously nothing evil, um, any good that you inspire me to do, I will do it because I know that even if I think it's, I can't do something, it's too much for me, or it's too hard for me, I know you will give me the grace to do it. So I, that's something that many Catholics, many Christians, Protestants, it's a very difficult thing to really say, 
Jesus, I will do whatever you want me to do. And so that's where it comes, you know, like I don't want somebody telling me what to do. What if it's something I don't want to do? And that's one thing. That's the pride, um, which is you don't want somebody, somebody telling you what to do, some, somebody bit bigger or better than you. And I think another part of why people don't want religion is bad example from their parents, from other people, their clergy, and also, I guess this is also a way of pride days, thinking, you know, they believe such silly things. They believe such foolish things. They're doing such, you know, things. I couldn't do that. I, could, I think it just goes back to pride, you know. Why would I kneel to, um, actually, that could bring us back to the beginning of our topic with the disorder that's going on. Right. That's, have, that's, yeah. Maria, what are you talking seen, about? All of those yeah, are the heart. Yeah. yeah, I've seen uh, videos and I've seen some news where people are kneeling to other human beings and saying, you know, all kinds of things, showing them either an apology or showing them their union that we're going to kneel to you because of what has happened to you. And this is really something because you see, when you don't have God in your life, well, then you're going to put something else there, and you're going to kneel to whatever is being proposed to you. Yeah, yeah, that is disturbing because um, it's more than just the simple event. It, it also reflects, I think, a mindset. And it's, yes, it, it, It's Definitely. pretty widespread. Yeah, it's pretty widespread, so that's disturbing in that regard. But uh, something else that I was thinking about, and I read this, and I hope I have this right, um, because, um, and it goes back to the truth and a good person who's seeking the truth. Uh, This was an article about who can go to heaven. Um, And it, uh, for example, let's say someone lives in a part of the world. They've never heard of Jesus Christ. They've just never heard of Jesus Christ. And so someone could say, well, then um, you, you, you could say that that person could never go to heaven because they don't know Christ. And um, the article this uh, said, well, no, another way you could look at this is if this person or these people are seeking truth, the absolute truth, the pure truth, not a relativism kind of truth, not their own truth, but the truth, then that right there is they're doing everything they can to to gain heaven for themselves. And if you think about what Christ said, and it kind of ties it in together nicely after I started thinking about uh, what the article said, Jesus did say, I am the life, I, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So, Christ himself says that he is the truth. So people who may not know of him through no fault of their own uh, because of, again, a remote place, uh, but are seeking the truth, they are really seeking Jesus Christ. Again, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I just thought that all tied in together very nicely so that the argument about, you know, you have to believe in God before you go to heaven. No, not necessarily. There are circumstances out there where that heart is pure and, uh, that, and, and that person is on their way to becoming a saint. Um, how, how does that strike you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Jesus is the truth. If somebody's really looking for truth, if they really want to have integrity, if they want justice, if they're looking for the truth, they're going to end up with Jesus. Yeah, and and again, let's assume they live in a society where, you know, Christ is known. Churches, you know, it's just a matter of them coming around to accepting, not that they, uh, that it's, like I said, a remote place where uh, Christianity has never been uh, preached or it's just unheard of. But, um, yeah, all these things that are going on, the, a disorder of the heart is a very broad statement, but it does cover uh, what we see in, in our not only our lives but society. Because um, if you don't have that standard, and the only standard that everybody can um, uh, that everybody has to uh, 
agree on that this is how we should live, um, it, it's got to be objective. And the only objective standard, in my mind, is the one that would come from the church because it was founded by Jesus Christ who set up the objective standard by teaching us how to live and how to love. Um, and um, so I, I just think it's, it's as simple as that, but it's also as difficult as that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and with a disorder that's so widespread these days, I have, and also with um, the lockdowns, all these things really have caused a lot more anxiety in many, many people. And, you know, even just grocery shopping now or shopping is just more anxiety provoking because you got to look where you're going you got to look which direction you're in you've got you know you have to make sure you have the mask all the time i mean although they say that you don't really have to have it it's not the law but it seems like it's general consensus one thing i've noticed is that there's actually more bibles more devotionals that are more in more prominent places in stores now more of them in, in more prominent places because people are, you know, this is, God is permitting this because always for a greater good and the greatest good is to turn to God. And it seems like even stores are trying to profit from it, unfortunately, but still it shows where the need is. Oh, really? I, I have, I, I'll be honest with you, I've not seen that. But uh, you, you have actually seen uh, today. I, actually, today I saw. I saw it the other day, and I noticed it. Yeah, I have. Um, there was actually in the Walmart near where I, where I shop today. It was in a more prominent place, and there were devotionals, Christian things, and you know, before they were in a. I don't. You know, I haven't really noticed them there. I've noticed them in the dollar store. They have, and also they have, you know, religious candles even in a supermarket, in in a couple of supermarkets that I go to. Um, they have religious candles, Catholic ones, because they have a large Hispanic. And the Hispanics, oh, my goodness, so many of them are still Catholic, even though so many do leave the Catholic Church. And that's one of my prayers, you know, really just to be able to reach out to the Hispanics and and befriend them. Because really, I believe probably the – that's my belief. I'm not – you know, I don't have statistics on it. I think the reason that they leave the Catholic Church primarily is because – of fellowship. I really don't think that they, I'm, that's what I'm thinking because they don't find, they don't feel they fit in. They don't feel that they're as welcome. Whereas the Protestant church is like open arms, come, come, you know? And so they, they flock over to these Protestant churches, which are more open. Obviously um, another problem would probably be um, the lack of the marriage problem. You know, that's a tough one because nowadays so many people are not, you know, married to one person, and and so that's a big thing with the Catholic Church as well. But I think their biggest thing is most likely just not feeling the warmth there. And I feel a kinship. I'm Italian, Southern Italy. I feel a kinship because for me, too, I've actually felt that in the Catholic Church. And when I was young, I went to several um, Protestant churches um, for a while, not very long, but for me, what held me from really joining them, they they had the fellowship down. They did. I felt welcome there. I felt like, yeah, come in, come, please, you know. And I never felt that in any of the Catholic churches in America. Never. I, You know, now I do, but this last church, and we travel to it, and other people travel to it because there's a community there. But so many, and I do believe some Catholic churches have a strong community, but the majority do not, and this is a huge, huge problem. Yeah, yeah, I, I tend to agree with you, and uh, that might be something for another show. But um, yeah, yeah, I just started thinking about that because of what you know is going on now with Black Lives Matter, and with you know every life does matter. The Black lives do matter. The Hispanic lives do matter, and especially with the Hispanic because they are such a Catholic group. I mean, you know, for they come from countries that are so Catholic. And for them to come here and to leave our Catholic faith, you know, we we are all called to evangelize. We are all called to share our faith and to help others in with our faith. That's what that's such a basic tenet of the Catholic faith is to 
show charity to other Catholics and then to others as well. But the Catholics are part of our family. So that's such a a group that's really been um, more and more on my heart as of late. Yeah, yeah. And and, uh, as you were talking, I was thinking about the fellowship. Uh, I think I uh, have seen that in in my own church over the years uh, because we've been going to it for, I don't know, good 40 years or so plus, yeah, but different priests have been there, you know, at different times. And I will say the group that we have there now, uh, what a change. Uh, he started all kinds of programs, uh, some of them ministries, some of them just get together, like, you know, men's basketball over over 30. Um, uh, so he just came up with all kinds of reasons for the uh, for, for the the faithful to show up at the church on the campus there, uh, whether it was um, you know Bible study or just having fun, you know the parish picnic, um, just uh, it was uh, just so many more avenues to show up there and become part of the family. And I think that was definitely missing early on. Um, it was, you know, kind of, in comparison, kind of sterile. And if that's what you're referring to, that is a turnoff, especially for people that are looking for a church to join. You know, they want to feel comfortable, especially if they're going to be raising their kids uh, in that area, and they're probably going to a certain church for a long time. But they want to feel that it fits their family and, and, and themselves. And, yeah, if you're coming away with a kind of a grab or blah feeling, um, that's not going to work in your favor. But I have to tell you, that has, there's been a major change in my own parish uh, in the last four or five years. Uh, I think it was getting better as we went along, but there was a major leap just just four or five years ago when we had this uh, new priest come in. He's really made an effort to uh, enhance the, uh, uh, the, the, you know, living, coming to the campus for many different reasons other than mass or holy days or adoration or anything like that. That is really wonderful. You, you and all the parishioners there are truly, deeply blessed. I think so. I think so. And a matter of fact, um, uh, I think I accused him of that <laughs> a couple of years ago. It was uh, on the way out. I said, Father, I think you're trying to uh, uh, not allow people. To, uh, they don't need an excuse to go anywhere else. You've got so many things going on here. That yeah. The only place you need to go is here. <laughs> that, <laughs> that I love that. It. Yes. Yes. You, 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 yeah. They don't have an excuse to go someplace. Yes. That's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, we'll have dinners, and uh, he's got even uh, what? What is that? Uh, uh, theology on tap, <laughs> uh, where you go. That to is local... so great! Oh yeah. my goodness! The, theology on tap. You go across. Uh, there's a local restaurant there, and I, I'm sure it's uh, under control. But uh, you know, adult beverages. But it's theology on tap. I mean, like I said. You, you, uh, except for maybe going shopping, food shopping, or going out to buy a car or some hardware supplies, or something. you really don't have to go too many other uh, other places than just uh, coming to our our campus. So that's a good thing. <laughs> wow! Wow! That sounds so. Oh my goodness! So wonderful! So enticing! Really, it's like oh my goodness! Oh, praying. I'm going to pray. I'm going to actually pray for that many other places that this is that this becomes very contagious and that this spreads all over oh uh maria uh i know you know our church but on saturdays at one o'clock uh you can uh they do a um ask father i think uh or it's a it's about a, it's an hour where they just sit in the living room since they can't get out you know we're in lockdown like everybody else and uh they just answer questions and um, the uh, the pastor there has a dog. His name is Fenway. And uh, the dog will even get questions. Fenway's in the picture. And it's just, it's like sitting at a picnic having a conversation. And the last few times since we're into summer, these priests have been in shorts. 
uh, and, and you know, the questions appear on the screen or, or whatever, and anybody can tune in, anybody can ask a question, and they ask really good questions, you know, faith-based questions, and you get really good answers. Um, and that wife, sounds excellent. Uh, oh, oh, try it. Tune in. You can tune in. Uh, All right. Uh, yeah, I think I will. Yeah, it's 1 o'clock on Saturday. My wife is a, a regular. I mean, uh, because we sometimes eat lunch a little bit late, and so uh, she goes, "Listen, I need to be a, I need to be somewhere at one o'clock, and that's where she is, sitting in front of the computer watching this." And it's been great. Also, there's a young lady that's going uh, to be a nun, and uh, they gave her an hour. I think it was a few Sundays ago, where people could call in and talk to her about her vocation, and it was just excellent. Um, you know, one of the priests was with her. It was just friendly conversation. And you just feel like you're part of that family. I'm glad you brought that up because I have to tell you, uh, anyone looking to come into this parish, I think, would find that fellowship that you were mentioning was missing. Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. It certainly sounds like you have that family, you have that warmth, that welcoming attitude. Oh, that's so wonderful. And that close-knit, you know, really, that's what our churches should be. We should be going there. Yeah. We, should kn- we should know. We should know who the other parishioners are. We should know them so well. That's how we can love them. And when we love them, we'll want to get to know them better. This is what creates a family. And every church is meant to be a family, and every family is meant to be a church. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, like I said, and it starts to solve all these uh, these societal problems too, because people that um, you know go there, they learn from other people, they take their faith uh, seriously. Um, they they want the common good. You don't need laws to do this. You've got the church, and the churches should, uh, whether it's Protestant or Catholic or, or you know Jewish, or it doesn't matter. Uh, faith uh, religions should be the ones, um, uh, you know, sponsoring the, the the good behavior, not laws. Laws are the fact that uh, something has failed in the system, whereas the, the churches and the religions are the ones that uh, would minimize the number of laws needed because the people have a good heart. They've gotten rid uh, of disorders of the heart by being a part of a uh, religious family, I think. Oh, I think you made an excellent point. When people are happy, they feel wanted, they feel welcome. When people are happy, they are going to do the right thing naturally. They're not going to need the laws. When people are unhappy, they're going to need more and more laws, and then they're going to feel more and more unhappy, and it doesn't work. Yeah, remember that article I sent you? Remember a while back, this is a side note. Remember that article I sent, to us, uh, uh, one page about Yes, on the horses? Yeah, take a look at that. Yes. Read that again yes. now that we've had this conversation. And that's really where that my comments were going. Uh, laws tend to show that things are broken down. Uh, fewer laws means a more just and a more loving society, fewer disorders. Because, because. The church's religion is doing its job. And when uh, it can't or it won't, then you this is what you get. I mean, the disorder is what you get, what you've see on the been seeing on the news lately. Uh, the yes. society is in the process of breaking down, I think. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. That's absolutely. And there are some people who really have evil intents who want yeah. the society to break down. And they are yeah. fostering it, encouraging it. Yes, I know, unfortunately. Yeah. But praise God, your church, your pastor, your church is doing so much good. And that good, it will just get stronger and stronger. That's really, really wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And I have to tell you, I don't know, I just, it's just the, the fact that these are young priests. Uh, the, the fellow that came a few years ago, he was in his late thirties. And we had one priest, probably the youngest priest I think that was ever ordained uh, around here it was 25. 25 wow. Years and the one we have now, he went off uh, to the military to serve as a chaplain in the military. And he was replaced with another priest who was just ordained. He's in his thirties, but he's excellent. I mean, I just can't, Say enough good things about 
the priests that have come to our parish recently, and they've all been young. Well, the first one was young. He, he'd been out of the seminary for some years, but the other two were just out of, out of uh, just ordained. And i, I got to tell you, I think the seminaries are doing an excellent job based on the two that we've seen uh, lately. That sounds so good. That's really uh, something to really thank God, to give him so much thanksgiving and gratitude because there are, I, I've seen even, you know, during these very difficult months, these past months, I've seen so much good. There is so much good that, you know, and with your parish, with things that I've seen in my own life, with my own family and my own parish, there is so much good. Um, like Romans 8.28, all things work for the good for those who love the Lord. And even things like lockdowns and even it's really hard to find the good in the um, in the violence that's been going on, but everything God will bring a greater good. Yeah, and I have to tell you, as you were talking about that, I'm glad you mentioned that verse because I I, I can't uh, you know say for sure. It just seems like to me that the sex abuse scandal in the Catholic Church caused such a reform as to how they, um, you know, uh, screen people for the priesthood. Uh, I'm, I'm actually thinking that we are the benefactors of that uh, because, um, and, and again, I don't know the process. I, I'm, I'm an outsider a little bit on this other than what I've heard, you know, in the news or at church or whatever. But uh, I, I think the as horrific and how evil the, the sex abuse scandal in the Catholic Church was. I think this is the good that's coming out of it. We have gotten such a, a, a fresh crop of priests that are so intense. They're just, they live their faith. I mean, you can just tell it when you talk to them, even before they become priests, when they're deacons and they're doing like an internship, you, you, you can just, when you talk to them, it's amazing. Uh, you just can feel it. So you talk about God being able to bring something good out of evil. I, I personally think that's one of the fruits of the one of the good fruits from that abuse scandal. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. I think you you're probably quite right. Yeah. Well, we reached. We've gone over, but it's fine. I mean, we always have such wonderful conversations, and we could probably just keep on talking for hours and hours, but. I know it's uh, yeah the, uh, the this this these kind of subjects uh, just you, you never run out of material you know I mean uh, one thing leads to another and it all ties together so that's why I think it's yeah. over a little bit so okay yeah well, it all ties done. yeah you know it all ties together and really it all ties together and no matter how dismal how bleak things look there is God who cares for us and who can inspire, give us hope. So really, you know, when we're talking, it's really good that we bring up these things, things that are going on currently, and really always put a positive, hopeful light on them. Because otherwise, you know, if you look at just what's going on, it can be very, very depressing, very, very disheartening. But we're always putting a positive spin, which is why it's so wonderful to talk about these things, because... Otherwise, if we don't communicate, if the parish, if the parishioners in the parish don't communicate individually, we will feel more and more anxious and disheartened. But when we talk about these things and, you know, with our radio show, with each other, we're really helping, helping the body of Christ to be inspired, encouraged, and hopeful. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, not only that, but I think once people do get engaged, they get sense a sense of peace and joy, they keep coming back for more. And uh, it, the, the hard part is just getting them to take that first step, to get them there and, and start to, uh, to engage somehow, as they say, meet people where they are. And then just simply uh, over time, they see what's going on in your life and the peace and joy that you seem to always have, and they want they want that, and they'll ask. And when they ask, that's when you answer questions honestly and truthfully and 
and uh, pretty soon you kind of you know light the fire and we'll take it from there. That, that's been my experience. Precisely. Yeah, you said it just exactly the way it is, exactly. We have to have it within our own hearts. And actually, this brings us right back to the very beginning of the show. If we have this peace, this joy in our hearts, we will have order in our, in our hearts, the proper order, which yeah. is the opposite of the disorder that yeah. creates the disordered society. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, okay. Well, it's a good place to end the, the show today. So, um, on the topic, now let's close with a prayer. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. Take care, Maria. Have a great week. Oh, you too, Dave. God bless everybody. Bye-bye. Hello, God's Beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.